Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, a public domain recording for LibriVox.org, read by Jim Cadwell. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child, and I was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, A wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee. So that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee, and the stars never rise but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life, and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. A Child's Nightmare by Robert Graves Read by Joy Chan for LibriVox.org Through long nursery nights he stood, by my bed unwearying, loomed gigantic, formless queer, purring in my haunted ear, that same hideous nightmare thing, talking as he lapped my blood, in a voice cruel and flat, saying for ever, Cat, cat, cat. That one word was all he said, that one word through all my sleep, in monotonous mock despair. Nonsense may be light as air, but there's nonsense that can keep horror bristling round the head. When a voice cruel and flat says for ever, Cat, cat, cat. He had faded, he was gone, years ago with nursery land, when he leapt on me again from the clank of a night train, overpowered me foot and head, lapped my blood, while on and on the old voice cruel and flat says for ever, Cat, cat. Cat. Morphia drowsed again I lay in a crater by high wood. He was there with straddling legs, staring eyes as big as eggs, purring as he lapped my blood, his black bulk darkening the day, with a voice cruel and flat. Cat, 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 cat. He said, cat, cat. When I'm shot through heart and head, and there's no choice but to die. The last word I'll hear, no doubt, won't be charge or bomb them out, nor the stretcher-bearer's cry, let that body be, he's dead. But a voice, cruel and flat, saying for ever, cat, cat, cat. The Dawn Patrol by Paul Boucher, read by Chip for LibriVox.org Sometimes I fly at dawn above the sea, where underneath the restless waters flow silver and cold and slow. Dim in the east there burns a newborn sun, whose rosy gleams along the ripples run, save where the mist droops low hiding the level loneliness from me. 
and now appears beneath the milk-white haze a little fleet of anchored ships which lie in clustered company and seem as they are yet fast bound by sleep, although the day has long begun to peep with red inflamed eye along the still deserted ocean ways. A fresh cold wind of dawn blows on my face, as in the sun's raw heart I swiftly fly and watch the seas glide by. Scarce human seem I moving through the skies, and far removed from warlike enterprise, like some great gull on high whose white and gleaming wings beat on through space. Then do I feel with God quite, quite alone, high in the virgin morn so white and still and Free from human ill, my prayers transcend my feeble earth-bound plaints, As though I sang among the happy saints with many a holy thrill, As though the glowing sun were God's bright throne. My flight is done. I cross the line of foam that breaks around a town of gray and red, Whose streets and squares lie dead beneath the silent dawn. Then... Am I proud that England's peace to guard I am allowed? Then bow my humble head in thanks to him who brings me safely home.
Now keep good watch. And they kissed her. She heard the dead man say, Look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though else should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years. Till now, on the stroke of midnight cold, on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger, at least, was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood to attention with the muzzle beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight. Blank and bare in the moonlight. And the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Had they heard it? The horse hooves ringing clear. Talat, talat, in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight and over the brow of the hill the highwaymen came, riding, riding, riding. The redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Talat in the frosty silence. Talat in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight, and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west. He did not know who stood bowed with a head or the musket drenched in her own red blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, and his face grew gray to hear how this, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shouting a curse at the sky with the white road smoking behind him. His rapier brandished high, blood red were his spurs in the golden noon. Wine red was his velvet velvet coat when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway with a bunch of lace at his throat. Ah, but still, of winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, and the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a high ribbon comes, riding, riding, riding. A high ribbon comes, riding up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn-yard. He taps with his whip at the shutters. But all is locked and barred. He whistles. A tune to the window. And who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter Bess? The landlord's daughter plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair.
and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair. With a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin, they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watch the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and, in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it, at all. And would it have been worth it, after all, would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, 
settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl, and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an intended lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous. Almost, at times, the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot Read by Christina Peterson and Richard Hart Music, copyright 2005 by William Cushman For more information about the music of William Cushman, please visit ghostnotes.blogspot.com for more information about LibriVox, please visit LibriVox.org. This has been a LibriVox recording. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alden Hines Loveliest of Trees, The Cherry Now by A. E. Houseman Loveliest of Trees, The Cherry Now Is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland dried, wearing white for Easter tide. Now of my threescore years and ten, twenty will not come again, and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room, about the woodlands I will go, to see the cherry hung with snow. The Matrix by Amy Lowell Read by Betsy Bush for LibriVox.org Goaded and harassed in the factory That tears our life up into bits of days, Ticked off upon a clock which never stays, Shredding our portion of eternity, We break away at last and steal the key which hides a world empty of ours. Ways of space unroll, and heaven overlays the leafy, sunlit earth of fantasy. Beyond the ilex shadow glares the sun, scorching against the blue flame of the sky. 
brown lily pads lie heavy and supine within a granite basin. Under one, the bronze gold glimmer of a carp. And I reach out my hand and pluck a nectarine. End of The Matrix Ode to Spring by Robert Burns A public domain recording for LibriVox.org Read by Jim Cadwell when mocking bucks at early fucks in the dewy grass are seen, sir, and birds on boughs take off their mouths among the leaves say green, sir, Latona's son looks licorice on Dame Nature's grand impetus, till his prick or eyes then westward flies to Roger Madam Thetis. The unwandering rill that marks the hill and glances o'er the bracer, slides by a bower where many a flower sheds fragrance on the day, sir. There Damon lay with Sylvia gay, to love they thought no crime, sir, the wild birds sang, the echoes rang, while Damon's arse beat time, sir. First with the thrush his thrust and push had compass large and long, sir. The blackbird next his tuneful text was bolder, clear, and strong, sir. The linnet's lay came then in play, and the lark that soared the boon, sir, till Damon fierce mistimed his arse, and fucked quite out of tune, sir. A Poison Tree by William Blake A Public Domain Recording for LibriVox.org Read by Jim Cadwell. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not. My wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears. And I sunned it with smiles and with soft deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright. And my foe beheld it shine and he knew that it was mine, and into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. The Red Cross Nurses by Thomas L. Masson Recorded by Chip for LibriVox.org Out where the line of battle cleaves the horizon of woe, and sightless warriors clutch the leaves the red cross nurses go in with the cots of agony mark death's unmeasured tide bear up the battle's harvestry the red cross nurses glide look where the hell of steel hath torn its way through slumbering earth the orphaned urchins kneel forlorn and wonder at their birth until above them calm and wise with smile and guiding hand, God looking through their gentle eyes, the Red Cross nurses stand. The Red Cross Spirit Speaks by John Finley, recorded by Chip for LibriVox.org Wherever war with its red woes, or flood, or fire, or famine goes, there too go I. If earth in any quarter shakes, or pestilence its ravage makes, thither I fly. I kneel behind the soldier's trench, I walk mid shambles, smear and stench the dead I mourn. I bear the stretcher, and I bend o'er Fritz and Pierre and Jack to mend what shells have torn. I go wherever men may dare, I go wherever woman's care and love can live. Wherever strength and skill can bring surcease to human suffering, or solace give. I helped upon Haldora's shore, with hospitaller knights I bore the first red cross, I was the lady of the lamp, I saw in Solferino's camp the crimson loss. I am your pennies and your pounds, I am your bodies on their rounds of pain afar, I am you doing what you would if you were only where you could, your avatar. The cross which on my arm I wear, the flag which o'er my breast I bear, is but the sign of what you'd sacrifice for him who suffers on the hellish rim of war's red line. The Shivering Beggar by Robert Graves Read by Joy Chan for LibriVox.org Near Clapham village, where fields began, 
St. Edward met a beggar man. It was Christmas morning, the church bells tolled. The old man trembled for the fierce cold. St. Edward cried, It is monstrous sin, a beggar to lie in rags so thin. An old grey beard and the frost so keen. I shall give him my fur-lined gabardine. He stripped off his gabardine of scarlet and wrapped it round the aged varlet, who clutched at the folds with a muttered curse, quaking and chattering seven times worse. Said Edward, Sir, it would seem you freeze, most bitter at your extremities. Here are gloves and shoes and stockings also, that warm upon your way you may go. The man took stocking and shoe and glove, blaspheming Christ our Saviour's love, yet seemed to find but little relief, shaking and shivering like a leaf. Said the saint again, I have no great riches, yet take this tunic, take these breeches, my shirt and my vest, take everything, and give due thanks to Jesus the King. The saint stood naked upon the snow, long miles from where he was lodged at Bow, praying, O oh God, my faith, it grows faint, this would try the temper of any saint. Make clean my heart, Almighty, I pray, and drive these sinful thoughts away. Make clean my heart, if it be thy will, this damned old rascal's shivering still. He stooped, he touched the beggar man's shoulder, and asked him, did the frost nip colder? Frost, said the beggar, no stupid lad, tis the palsy makes me shiver so bad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alden Hines The Tiger by William Blake Tiger, tiger, burning bright In the forests of the night, What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears, and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? The Tiger by William Blake, a public domain recording for LibriVox.org, read by Jim Cadwell. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dead grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? The Walrus and the Carpenter by Lewis Carroll a public domain recording for LibriVox.org, read by Jim Cadwell. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might, 
he did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright, and this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. He could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. O oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock, conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath, and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar, besides, are very good indeed. Now if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice, the carpenter said nothing, but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf, for I have had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick, the carpenter said nothing but the butters spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none and this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one.